the association of noise and power has never really been broken in human imagination. Argues Schaffer Murray in his book, The Soundscape, Our Sonic Environment and the Tuning of the World. Murray mentions that in earlier times, all natural events were explained as miracles. Loud noises, such as the sound of a thunder, evoked fear and respect back to the earlier times, seeming to be an expression of divine power. The colonial era was the imposition of a monotonal and singular vocal structure, which silenced the diversity previously there. As Schaffer mentions, linguistic accuracy is not merely a matter of lexicography. We perceive only what we can name. In a man-dominated world, when the name of, of a thing dies, it is dismissed from society, and its very existence might be imperiled. In the modern era, the respect for the natural sounds of a thunder, a volcano, or a storm was, respect, was re replaced by the respect to the sounds created by industrial machinery. There was a power shift. Every living being exists because all other living beings exist. Through euphonies and cacophonies of complex interconnection, life vibrates and echoes throughout the planet. There are connections that are more visible and easily imagined than others. The Amazon rainforest might be so diverse because it nourishes itself from the sand that travels on the wind from the Sahara Desert across the Atlantic Ocean. At the same time, the northernmost peak of South America is affected by Germany's energy consumption. Why is that? A possible starting point might be tracing resources back to their sources. A source is where components originate. It is usually active and its existence is often entangled within a complex environmental network. On the contrary, a resource is understood as a means, an asset that fo functions efficiently. Resources are often extracted and manipulated and obey market regulation. The difference between a source and a resource lies in human intervention. Humans transform sources into resources, adapting them to, the, to our demands. Resources are therefore often understood, understood in numbers. Through the transformation and numeric abstraction of resources, we often forget the sources they spring from and the workflow that lies behind them. In a similar process of abstraction in the neoliberal world we live in, the infrastructures and technologies that surround us have become deeply adopted by and adapted to our lifestyles, to the point of appearing as ubiquitous. In effect, a background noise we have learned to ignore. From within this these frameworks, we are unable to distinguish the apparatus that lies behind them not only on a technical level, but also in regard to the mo models they pursue and sustain. An equivalent on a smaller scale might be the energy that is powering this microphone right now. Where does our electricity come from? In the northern part of the South American continent lies the Guajira Peninsula, an extensive desert right on the Caribbean coast, which is home to the largest Aboriginal community in both Colombia and Venezuela. Originally a nomadic tribe having migrated 3,000 years ago from the Amazon rainforest and the Antilles to the desert, the Waju and Afro Waju have since preserved this territory as a communitary space. La Guajira is filled with oral contrast. In the background, the wind as a means of circulation, flowing with diverse speeds and intensities, roaring stereophonically across the territory. The wind shapes the paths of the sand and sculpts the sand dunes that give texture to the landscape. 
There are some places where the wind does not fluctuate. And that quietness and stillness corresponds with a funeral ritual, a celebration of life and death in the Wajú community at Cabo de la Vela. Along the coast, next to the infinite kilometers of sand and wind, almost as a surprise, a mass of salty water apiece appears, caressing the coast. Waves rock incessantly, receding, absorbing, and exploding repeatedly. Always different, but at the same time constant, mini cyclical explosions, which despite their imposition, generate tranquility by repetition, or at least the illusion of repetition. Throughout the desert, there are Waju settlements called rancherias. They are built from trupillo tree and yotohoro, the heart of a dried cactus. Inside these rancherias, a hammock or chinchorro always hangs. Goats split while women of the community weave colorful mochilas and dresses. The needle transversing colorful threads, knotting, pulling, threading, accompanied by some chit chat. I wonder if those colors are a way to dialogue with the dry desert. During their daily work, shepherds from these communities use aerophone instruments, instruments in which the air vibrates mainly inside a tube. Sawawa, Wotoroi, Masai, Wawai, Kasha, and Tropa are all blown instruments, blown in reciprocal dialogue with the wind. Such instruments are used to lead the animals while also serving as a means of sound expression for the shepherd. The language of the Waju is Wayunaki. The consonants are long and the accent generally falls on the second syllable of the word. In rituals or celebrations, marking the first menstrual cycle of Waju woman, for example, when a request for a dream or the healing of some disease is made, the kasha, a bimembranophone percussion instrument, is played. Kasha is a type of drone made of pine or seiva. With a twisted coat, hide at the end. The instrument also leads the Yona Kasha dance, a celebration where two members of the community chase each other with their colorful dresses, dialoguing with the wind. Nearby, one can hear the struggling engine of jeeps with their considerable tires and traction, arriving from the urban centers to the desert. From within these vehicles, one can hear vallenato music ringing through the stereos. Rhythms and melodies from the urban region of Guajira that involve the accordion, the guacharaca, the maracas, and the box. In fact, some say that it's German settlers who in the mid of the 19th century brought the accordion to the municipality of Riohacha. The Vallenata box was an Afro-Colombian addition that along with the Huacharaca, an instrument from the Aboriginal communities, gives Vallenato its particular sound. Colonial division of territories affected the Wayu and afro Wayu communities. They came to belong to two nation states, Colombia and Venezuela. While some borders have been shut down, despite geopolitical divisions, the communities strive for the preservation of the territory as a borderless living with its own memory. The Wayu and Afro Wayu understand themselves as a tribe of 56 families. The grandmother is the leader of the community, the Piachi, and the person in charge of healing. The Piachi is a self-taught healer who has dreamed of her role and the way to carry it out. She has a, speci a special channel of communication through which she can express what the territory needs. According to the Waju worldview, 
the world was created by a romance between the rain and the earth. To make the earth happy, the rain chanted, and as it yodeled, thunder and lightning roared and released energy that allowed life to emerge. First the flora, then the fauna, and finally humans. Despite this myth, since 2010, there has been no more energy producing thunder or lightning, nor there have been raindrops chanting, as a result of which, in 2014, the territory was declared a region in crisis. The Piachi recently said in an interview, quote, the Maquira, our territory, is not good for walking anymore, nor for growing crops or nourishing our animals. We are all thirsty and slowly malnourished. We are burning, quote. In the midst of these conditions, Rejón, one of the largest open coal mines in the world, was founded. The landscape changes from a palette of light orange, blue, and green to a vast concave surface. A human valley of gray and black patches in combination with heavy machinery. Backhoes car the earth. Machinery vibrates, digging and extracting. A cacophony of minerals. Industrial metal, a transformed mineral. Crashing and crumbling layers of earth in search of coal, a non-transformed mineral. The operation is so big that no human noise surpassed the acoustic presence and dominance of machinery. Huge wheels dig into the ground, crushing anything small. The sound of extraction is like that of something being forced out and through this removal, immediately becoming something else. These incessant vibrations have dominated the landscape from 1976 until the present day. Cerrejón was both a promise of employment and development, and a tool to bring attention to the zone. Nevertheless, it has turned out to be one of the main sources of problems for the, both the region and the community. Being mostly owned by foreign companies, BHP, Anglo American, and Glencore, 98% of what Cerrejon yields is exported, with only 10% of total sales remaining as profit for the state. On top of that, due to the centralized system of royalties, as well as regional mismanagement, the community rarely receives any profit. Beyond a disproportionate economic relationship, Cerrejon has had severe implications for the local Wajú communities, depriving them from the basic necessities and prioritizing the project's economic ambitions over the life of the community. Cerrejon has caused numerous cases of involuntary resettlement affecting the community's traditional lifestyle and subjecting them to conditions imposed by the management company. Moreover, deep excavation and mining has caused severely unhealthy air pollution. Due to inadequate consultation processes, the air is full of particles of coal, which have already affected the health of newborn babies and also disrupted the balance of aquifers across the whole zone. On top of that, Official sources affirm the mining companies are subject to controversial allegations related to displacement and collaboration with paramilitary. As some can imagine, the existence of a coal mine in the desert is highly paradoxical and problematic. Open coal mines require double the amount of water that closed coal mines do. Due to this structural conundrum, Cerrejón has privatized the Rancheria River, the main source of water in the desert. Furthermore, it has purposely dried out several of the streams that divert from the riverbed in order to extract coal from beneath them. In 2019 and 2020, 
after a letter from the Community in Deeper Research carried out by Universidad Nacional and United Nations, the Constitutional Court to why sued the company for causing life-threatening pollution and human rights violations. Today, Cerrejón is still operating with a license to extract coal until 2034. When will water be more valuable than coal? To ask when will water have a higher value than coal is to ask when our collective survival will have a higher value than the accumulation of profit by a few. With the 70 million liters of water extracted daily and the 4,700 members of the community whose life has perished due to the unbearable conditions, it seems as if some of the states are being complicit in a genocide. Despite efforts to penalize multinationals and compensate the affected communities, the mechanisms of compensation fail to acknowledge the complexity of the effects and consequences over a longer time frame, not only environmental, but social, cultural, and symbolic. As postmodernist theorist Arturo Escobar says, the process of deterioration not only includes the dispossession of a population, but also the process of removing the territory from the population. The population is transformed. Are there economic measures that account for such involuntary transformation? What keeps Arrejones in existence is the fact that even with the penalties, the business is still highly profitable, which underlines this disproportionate, disproportionate value given to commercial interests. How to quantify the cultural and symbolic value of a river to an Aboriginal community? Such values are challenging to quantify, and most of the time they are not even recognized. But what if we were to really devise a real accountability that includes social, cultural, and environmental effects in both the immediate and longer term? As Natasa Petresin Bachelet suggests, by exploding their natural resources and hence by durably damaging their environment, industrialized countries owe a huge debt to countries of the South. This ecological debt is much bigger than the financial debt the South supposedly owes the North. Taking it into account would completely transform the way we think about global economy. Between Berlin's abundant Spre River and the Kopenike Strasse, actually across the window of this room, stands the Heise Kraftwerk, a combined heat and power plant in the Mitte district. Despite the fact that the energy company Fattenfall Heisekraffer is visually so imposing, an industrial castle with two large chimneys and red lights that dominate the landscape of the spray, its oral presence is barely perceptible. This absence of sound from such a large facility brings to mind an industrial deafness and the invisible trail that runs from resources to commodities. The industrial proceeding of energy remains concealed within the headquarters of the factory, but what is commonly heard instead of industrial noises is the vibrations of the energy the plant produces in the form of electronic music, floating from nearby venues, Kraftwerk and Tresor, for example. Electronic music is one of the first outcomes we can reclaim from such energy conversion. The power plant belongs to the Swedish energy group Vattenfall Europe Varme, which belongs to an energy, to a German subgroup responsible for the operation of the plant. Vattenfall is the electric utility for the German states of Hamburg, Mecklenburg, or Pommern, Brandenburg, Berlin, Saxony, Anhalt, Thuringia, and Saxony. As the sixth largest consumer of energy in the world, Germany imports more than half of its energy. Nonetheless, 
the country claims it is on the way towards being one of the world's most major renewable energy economies and has a reputation for its low carbon emissions. Vattenfall has taken the commercial decision to do business in Colombia, say, says the official website. Quote, Colombian coal is attractive. For Vattenfall, both for a commercial and a technical perspective and enables us to maintain a diversified sourcing portfolio. The official Cerrejón website affirms as well, we generate social environment, economic and individual value for Guajira and the region of Colombia. In the land where thunder and lightning created life, there is not even water anymore. All this energy is now in the global north. Reviewing the National Environmental Indexes, which makes countries such as Germany, Norway, or Canada so proud in relation to the sources they import and the containers of waste they export, I can only think that these indexes are part of a neo-colonial strategy of distortion of ethics. What is the use of green certificates if they only include the domestic activities and ignore the respective importation of resources and exportation of waste? Green certificates should not be a national award, but should include a real account of the quality of energy produced and consumed on a planetary scale. When, we, when will we stop pretending the planet is not our common territory? When will we overcome the fiction of value determined by the market in which a barrel of oil reached negative values in April of this year, but its extraction affected the water, air, flora and fauna of its source? When will we understand that we need each other for our planetary survival and that the environmental sustainability uh, cannot happen at the expense of the life of others? If Western concerns about climate change don't go hand in hand with a deep process of social justice, it's a one-sided struggle, incomplete and probably ineffective. Not until we embrace a borderless notion of territory which takes into account the specifics of local communities and also embraces interrelationality. Can we attempt to really transform the, nature, the notion of nature as solely a resource to extract a direction aligned with the probability of human extinction? Borderless planetary awareness is not universalist, nor does it intend to standardize or reduce the complexities of communities. Instead, it sets horizontal dynamics based on such particularities. Borderless planetary awareness acknowledges that making the Guajira a place that cannot support life and losing the Waju community as a consequence, like other communities devastated by resource extraction, is not only a national failure, but a planetary failure. If resources have value as transformed sources, let's claim back the value of sources. Tracing resources to the source acknowledges the living beings that are part of a planetary equilibrium. Tracing resources to the source can contribute to a planetary society which is not based on production and consumption, a society in which we humans are also not seen as mere resources or workforce, but as sources in our own, our, our own right. For some original communities, Underground minerals, such as coal, oil, and gold, resonate as sources themselves. Ritual sources, which, through their existence in specific places underneath the ground, trigger processes of rooting and consequent care for the territory, sources to be worshipped. If colonization and neocolonization implies an imposition of a homogenizing voice, and a consequent silencing of, silencing of the rest, decolonization must be centered on listening. Only through a deep listening can we begin to perceive the contingent composition of sounds and allow other worldviews to emerge. Perhaps it is time to listen 
Please continue, please.